Well, welcome to those of you who are here with us tonight. My name is Gianna. I'm one of the reference librarians here at the Chelmsford Public Library. Um, before we begin, I just want to make sure everyone knows um, if you have any questions during David's presentation, you're welcome to type them into the chat or the Q&A feature at the bottom um, menu in your Zoom window. Um, so type those in there and then David can get back to those questions later on once he's finished up with his presentation. And welcome everyone. We're here for a compelling questions program. What does climate change mean for Massachusetts plants and animals? So the Massachusetts Audubon Society will present a changing climate in Massachusetts. As we become more exposed to the impacts of global climate change, you may be asking yourself what it means for Massachusetts. This presentation will introduce the ongoing effects climate change has on the Commonwealth's plants and animals and the habitats they rely on. Take a look at what's happening in your own neighborhood and what actions you can take individually and collectively to mitigate them. And now our present presenter for this month's compelling questions is David Moon. David Moon is Community Science and Coastal Resilience Manager for Mass Audubon North Shore and works from Joppa Flats Education Center in Newburyport. David has spent 40 years in environmental education as a teacher, non-formal program ed director, and administrator. Other work included other work included executive director of a citizen science organization. He founded farm-based education programs, and he teaches tropical forest ecology in Costa Rica for Franklin Pierce University. David has an MS in environmental education from Antioch University, New England. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to David, and he will get started with his presentation for us. Thank you so much, Jana. I'm really happy to be here to talk about this with everyone tonight. Um, one thing that I want to share is that I um, have been working with a crew of people to um, create this presentation you're going to see tonight. Um, a few of the slides are separate pieces that I put in for because of the work I specifically do. But um, I'm just going to switch us over into that um, presentation and start the slideshow. And I think that'll work OK. There we go. OK. So you all should be able to see my slide. And you can decide whether you want to have me you know, my head moving around in the corner, or you can minimize the um, the participant screen as I will do um, so that you can see more, more of the pictures instead of me moving around. Okay, so this program is going to be, you know, the title of climate change in your community. Um, and then what does it mean? What does climate change mean for Massachusetts plants and animals speaks to the mission of Mass Audubon, which is to protect nature for people and wildlife in Massachusetts. And um, it's a pretty exciting time for us because of kind of what this means for how we are going to be responding to climate change. So um, just so you know, Mass Audubon is a statewide nonprofit organization. We are we have a similar name to National Audubon, but we're a totally separate organization from them or from the other state uh, based Audubon groups that are out there, such as New Hampshire Audubon or Connecticut Audubon. Um, it was actually the first one that got started, and um, and it, we should really be proud of living in Massachusetts, in my opinion, because the state is covered in um, sanctuaries with nature centers, unstaffed sites where you can enjoy nature, and with partnerships we have with other organizations to manage land and create access to nature for lots of people. Um, I'm going to mention this very shortly, that in 2020, with this amazing pandemic facing us and fiscal losses and a decision to how we're going to move forward, we really made a major pivot in how we meet our mission that did not change to protect nature. And there are these three things that are really interconnected with each other. One is really protecting resilient landscapes, and I'll be talking about that later. Um, a major goal to bring more audiences in to make sure that what we offer is equally distributed to anyone who wants it. Um, and then another goal specifically to fight climate change, which really wraps back around and helps us think about how we're trying to um, protect and then steward resilient landscapes. And that stewardship is something we're going to get to into in detail. As we do that, um, and one of our more inclusive practices um, over the past several years has been to figure out how we want to talk about uh, the fact that 
in our land of Massachusetts, um, there's a thousands year old um, inhabitant an inhabitation by humans, um, going back thousands of years with indigenous people, and we're we're working on how we can make a statement, which you're seeing here, of the peoples that lived in Massachusetts, and um, and what we should be saying about how we go forward with this acknowledgement, um, in terms of inclusion and recognition, and in in a, a number of different cases, undoing unequal treatment and undoing past wrongs that were done um, to the folks that lived here when uh, European settlers came and subsequently to other people that have come into our into our society. So these statements are important to us and I didn't read them, but they're there for you to see. Okay, so our agenda tonight is um, to kind of begin with touching base on what is going on with climate change. And even though some of these um, slides, you may have seen pieces of it before, it's to put it together in a way that helps launch what we're going to say about how this is going to affect wildlife and people um, and how climate change can be solved. So you see that piece down there towards the, the bottom of solutions and how individuals uh, specifically can get involved. So that's what our agenda for tonight is. And now I will launch into it. Okay, so um, we're going to start with what's really happening with, um, with our changing climate. Um, there's a definition for climate change that we actually, a bunch of us got together, looked at a lot of different definitions. And this was um, what came together with all the science that we looked at and, um, and with the essential social meaning of, of climate change. It is fast. And it is something that has go, goes on because of natural um, causes over, over thousands and thousands of years. But what we're talking about now is something that threatens humans and natural systems, that this particular change in climate is caused by human activities, okay, and primarily greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and that um, at the same time, because we caused it, we also can mitigate it and reverse it. Um, through the policies that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, and in doing so, address social and economic disparities that we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so here are some, this is a graphic that's similar to stuff that I've been showing for a while, though as we worked through it and kind of refreshed it, um, the, this is the best science we have right now. What we're looking at in terms of climate change is increasing the number of days with high temperatures above 90 degrees, um, which were around four days a year in 1960, and increasing, we're at 10 now, um, it, but we we'll, are projected to increase to 19 days a year uh, by 2050, um, which is a really long time out. Um, I expect maybe, you know, I may still be alive by then, but you're feeling those effects year after year, more and more really hot days because of that 2.9 degree um, rise in temperature. Um, the number of uh, days of the growing season therefore has gone up. Um, some people consider that could consider that something that they can make use of. Um, but the thing is about growing seasons is that uh, our storms are getting stronger. Now that, that, that general term 55%, well, what is that about? Well, that's about wind, rain, um, storm surge, um, all kind of adding up to our storms are really stronger than they used to be, whether it's a thunderstorm or a nor'easter or a hurricane. Um, these uh, we're experiencing stronger and stronger level uh, uh, weather. Um, and then I really want you to look at the piece down there on the lower uh, part of the slide. 11 inches of sea level rise has occurred since 1992 as measured in Boston Harbor. That means that the low tides, the high tides, all the tides are almost a foot higher overall than they used to be. And um, many of you may realize, oh yeah, there's that road that floods all the time. Well, that may not have happened um, long ago, and now it does, and we're having to deal with that. And that, that rise in sea level is something that is very much in the forefront of my mind as a coastal resilience manager for Mass Audubon. Okay, so this is an image from the March 2 storm of uh, 2018, when water came over the 
um, the wall in Boston Harbor and went into a lot of um, parking garages and that kind of thing. And now I would like to um, offer people a chance to um, unmute themselves if you want, if anyone wants to make a co comment about ways you have seen climate change in our, in your own experience. Let's see if anybody, I think you would have to raise your hand. I'm trying to see how that might work. And I don't know if Gianna can, can help that happen. If I don't see it happening on a technical basis, I'll just continue. But I'm looking at the list of folks and looking to see if anybody has their hand up. Okay. Well, I can tell you some things. I'm going to tell you some things in this um, that I have seen in terms of climate change. And maybe in this particular mode, we're not really able to, to have um, the kind of participation, but I don't see any changes in anybody's, um, in anybody's, um, per, you know, participation thing. So I'm afraid I'm gonna have to move on from that. But um, we're going to start with some basics on how it works, just in case we can't assume everybody knows some of these basics. And I'm going to try to go through them succinctly so that, um, so that we're, you know, not boring people that have heard this all before. We have changed our climate by changing our atmosphere. We've changed the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels uh, primarily, though there's some other things that we do. Um, and those, that burning releases carbon dioxide, which is the biggest, most um, prevalent uh, gas that is at a higher concentration in our atmosphere than it used to be. Um, there's more methane. You see that little CH4 in the middle of the cloud in the middle there. That's another one that is happening and there are a few others. But what happens is that when sunlight goes through that air, um, they, it heats up the surface, and then that heat is able to be um, is able to just radiate back into space unless it's trapped by particular kinds of gases in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a better trapper of heat than than other gases, though um, methane CH four is another really strong one, um, and by increasing the amount of carbon dioxide. We're trapping that heat in a greater way. That's really basic physics. And it's like we're putting a blanket on ourselves that is warmer, a warmer blanket than we had before. And that's changing the atmosphere's uh, temperature, though most of that heat is actually being absorbed by the ocean at the moment. Okay, so the emissions of those greenhouse gases um, come from a lot of different sources. You can see lifted, listed here on the right, or on the left rather. And then there are, are capturers of uh, greenhouse gases, of especially carbon dioxide. Um, the land, uh, the processes of soil um, and, and ecosystems on land um, actually captures carbon. When you grow a tree, it's made a lot of carbon. Um, and then uh, processes in the oceans do that as well. But currently, the ability of land processes and processes in the ocean to recapture that carbon um, only gets a uh, little more than 40% of what's being put into the air. And that means that the, the increasing concentration of greenhouse gases um, are still growing really, really rapidly. I just want to call your attention to the source that this came from, Project Drawdown. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. It's one of the organizations we urge you to look at. Uh, Project Drawdown has a very helpful um, look at all this, which is to say that we can reduce those current sources and we can increase the sinks through our actions. And so they have a plan with existing technology, let alone anything we might invent in the future, to not only stop the increase in greenhouse gas and in the increase in heating our, our atmosphere, but also reverse it and get ourselves back to pre-industrial levels so that we can actually control the atmosphere and put our planet in balance. And that's a really exciting prospect. And it's not based on um, science fiction, it's based on what we know we can do now. Okay, so this is the kind of graph people have been seeing for many years, um, but it's important because of just the, the scale of change that has happened in such a short period of time. And the fact that the change in carbon dioxide concentration is way out of whack with anything that's happened over the last 800,000 years. And so that's a big deal. And we need to get rid of that. We need to bring that level 
that those concentrations of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases back to historic norms, um, or else we're going to face some really, really um, impossible to live with changes. Um, here's a really fun piece of data from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. Um, and just think about that signal and how regular, it's like waves going up and down every single year um, with an overall trajectory of up, up, up in the parts per million of carbon dioxide. So what would account for uh, for that up and down? What do you think? Um, if you zoomed in and every year there's this up and this down. And what that is, is the growth of leaves and trees during the growing season in the Northern hemisphere. Isn't that fun and wonderful? The area of earth in the Northern hemisphere is much bigger than in the Southern hemisphere. And so the trees of the Northern hemisphere are those dips. Trees really do a lot. It just shows that it can make a big difference to uh, grow a bunch of trees. So that's something we're gonna talk about. So another way to think about this is essentially where, where will Massachusetts be? Where is it now? in terms of you know where you see where we are on the map but then it's showing our the, in black the current climate status of Massachusetts since the changes have begun to happen um which has shifted us to just a, a little bit north southern new york just north of new jersey northern pennsylvania that is essentially what we've moved to not tremendous change um, but not quite the same New England with weather winters that we're used to and hotter summers. Um, now, if we are able to stick to one of the agreements that was supposed to lower emissions really dramatically, uh, between you know the, the last uh, decades of this century, we either are going to change to something that's along the lines of the mid-Atlantic, or else if we just keep doing what we're doing, the climate of Massachusetts by the end of the century would look like that of South Carolina previously. And that's just not something we want. So it is gonna change. It, the, 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 uh, there's nothing we can do about heat being released that's trapped in the ocean and changing things, but we can really mitigate it through things we know how to do, which is the message we really want you to, to, uh, to hear tonight. Um, one of the things about storms that's really causing troubles um, is just that there's more moisture in the air, and that is because the ocean is warmer. So if you heat it up, it creates more what you kind of see in this analogy of a cup of coffee, more vapor goes into the air, and that gives fuel to storms that can be more powerful and drop more moisture, and that is happening. Um, I think this is another one that is um, really important to think about because these are sort of those those windows within which we see changes that are on the way are kind of baked into what we've got but where if we change our behavior if we change our systems um, in ways that i think people will really end up really enjoying um the temperature doesn't have to go to 11 degrees uh, more than it is now we've already added a little more than two we don't want to add 11 okay um we don't want to add 64 days over 90 degrees more every year. Um, and we don't wanna add seven feet of additional sea level rise. Um, we're gonna have to deal with three by the end of the century. Um, and the number of storms with high precipitation would go up as well. So these are the kind of windows that we're working with as we try to make a difference in this situation. Um, a comparative way to think about this is that when we had a mile of ice over us, which is the way it was during the last glaciation, the last glacial period, um, Massachusetts was covered with about a mile of ice, which is how we get some of the really cool landforms we see today. Um, that was nine degrees cooler than we have now. So try to imagine if we increase by 11, it's not gonna be easy to live with if it's livable at all. So that's why we're really pushing hard to make changes now and um, find ourselves in a good position to help um, as an organization that works with nature. So don't forget that um, if you're talking about this, I mean, if you're already kind of on board with all this, fine. If you're not, we can have questions and stuff at the end. But there's a big difference between weather and climate. And every time we have a cold snap in the winter, people that want to push against the idea that we have to do something about climate change say, hey, look, it got cold today. See, it's all fine. Well, weather is something that is very variable. 
um, over short periods of time. Climate is something generally to expect over longer periods of time. And um, I actually really like this analogy here, where weather is what you should telling you to wear today, whereas climate tells you what kinds of clothes you got to have to deal with the variation in your particular zone. Okay, so that's kind of the, the way we're thinking about this, how to differentiate those things. Okay, so we're Mass Audubon. Our mission is to protect nature for wildlife and people. And um, so when we talk about climate change, there's going to be a lot less about um, what you can do with buildings and cars and um, overall infrastructure and national policy. Then we're going to be talking about nature, how it's impacted, and how nature can help, which is uh, the really upside of all of this. Okay, so the big picture is habitat loss. Um, climate change causes more disturbance to habitats, stronger storms, um, more extremes of heat, um, and some in, in many cases, a uh, lack of snow can change habitats or disturb them in ways that um, that are that are troublesome for the ecosystem involved. So this is a picture of some salt marsh down at our um, long pasture sanctuary in Barnstable, and it's showing eroding salt marsh peat, which I'm going to talk a lot about later. Um, one of the big things that is going on on the coast that we have in here, because this is you know happening in a North Shore context, is that salt marsh is is shrinking. Um, and it's trying to migrate up with the sea level. I mean, 11 more inches of tide um, can create salty areas that weren't there before. But what it's often encountering is the tides encountering human development that prevents that migration from happening. Um, but what's going to happen is that water areas will expand um, and these uh, salt marsh platform areas are going to decrease. And that's something that we're going to work with. Um, the idea that salt marsh might migrate up um, is something we want to work on. We want to facilitate that. Or if you look at the the zone three of low marsh, that might um, that that might turn to water, whereas the high marsh might turn to low marsh. And then what you would hope is that the high marsh would be able to go into that upper border. But it all depends on the topography of the border and whether humans have put impediments in the way. So that's something I'm thinking about all the time these days. There's so many impacts of climate on forests, and I'm going to have to share some um, some kind of rough stuff about that. But the extreme precipitation is rough on trees. They fall down when the soil gets saturated and in stronger winds that happen. Um, and so there's just now that's a natural process We trees always fall down and new trees grow up, but increasing disturbance overall can simplify more complex structures in forests um, so that you have a more disturbed area. It helps certain invasive species of plants move in. And um, we're also experiencing more and more droughts. Um, so you have these big rain events. You also have longer droughts uh, that are interspersed in there. And that can really have a big effect on forests. Um, one of the other things that happens is that it's allowing some kinds of pests to proliferate. So this is a picture of a, of a little aphid called a hemlock woolly adelgid. And those little aphids have killed hemlocks south of Massachusetts. There are vast areas where there aren't really any big hemlocks anymore. I was in the Smoky Mountains in April and um, all the huge old growth hemlocks in those amazing forests down there have fallen down, though there are a few young ones that hopefully are uh, resistant to the woolly adelgid, but the woolly adelgid is killed by hard frost, by super hard um, cold temperatures, and as those decrease, it's spreading to the north. Um, another thing that we're expecting is just that the kind of forest we have is going to change, um, that those disturbances mean that as trees go down, the kind of forest we've always had over thousands of years is going to change from domination of maple, beech, and birch to oak hickory. And that's going to be something that's going to be a disturbance and a change. Okay, so what does this mean for wildlife? Well, um, back in 2017, we did um, a very um, deep dive into modeling what would happen to future habitats in Massachusetts based on work that had already been done by a lot of people that 
uh, create these models, and then what that would mean for birds in Massachusetts. So um, in a nutshell, you, you are going to have a link um, in the resources that we give you uh, to where you can really dive into this in detail if you would like to. There's a whole you know, book of a report that I showed the cover of there, um, but that it kind of netted out that you know, equal parts, not very vulnerable. And these are birds that are, that actually nest in Massachusetts, breeders, okay? And those include birds that live here year round, as well as birds that come up from the tropics or the Southern US to breed here. But there are breeding birds. About, you know, 42%, close to half, um, are not very vulnerable or will do better because of the changing conditions. There are birds that are increasing in our state because of the change. Um, then there's another similar set, though, that are highly vulnerable and that their populations are declining. And um, about 30% of those vulnerable species are really declining and are in need of conservation action. And I'm going to show you one that we think might be the first one to actually go extinct because of climate change. And then there's some that are kind of in, in between. We think they're likely vulnerable. But this gives you kind of a breakdown of what our, our analysis uh, showed. Now, this goes really down into the weeds. Um, but um, the thing is that, you know, in terms of numbers of species that are in those percentages, um, but then when you get into specific environments like salt marsh, where it says 70% of salt marsh nesting species are highly vulnerable, you get into a particular habitat and there's a lot of variation in this. It's not an even uh, distribution of the effects of this across the uh, ecosystems of the state. Salt marshes are really important. Um, and so are forests. So um, the ones that seem to do the best, though, are the ones that have already adapted to human um, human uh, changes in in and landscapes. Okay. Now I think this is um, I, I don't know who found this because I didn't I didn't find this slide, but this is a really really fascinating slide. What it's showing you is that as the ocean is warming. Um, our, our oceans are warming, which is why sea levels are rising, because when water warms up, it expands, it gets bigger. And that it means that the ocean is um, getting higher. And um, that's not happening evenly around the world. Um, the Gulf of Maine has increased in temperature by more than a lot of other areas. So that's what we're what we're dealing with in most of Massachusetts. But this is showing you the purple areas are where are, are the amounts of lobster caught year after year. And you start, you see it starting in 1967, and then it goes up to the year um, 2014. And look at all the lobster being caught in New Hampshire and Maine. They were catching lobster before, but what it also means is that New York is not really catching much lobster anymore. And um, there's a really interesting movie if you're jotting notes that you should watch at some point called Lobster War, which is about what's going on on an island up there in the mouth of the Bay of Fundy um, called Machaya Seal Island. And the millions of dollars worth of lobster that have moved into a, an area of ocean that is, um, is disputed between the US and Canada. And there isn't really a war, but it's a really interesting movie about that. So that's something you can stream, I think, for free online. Um, Animals are showing up, not just birds. And we're going to talk about some birds that are showing up, but animals are showing up in the ocean as well. And so blue crabs are something that people like to eat quite a bit in the mid-Atlantic, but they are starting to show up in the Gulf of Maine. And I haven't seen one yet. I grew up with those going to New Jersey in the summer times, but um, really they didn't go north of Cape Cod before. And now they're starting to, um, to appear. And that can really have cause, cause changes in ecosystems. Nothing wrong with blue crabs, but they haven't been here before, and that could cause some kinds of impacts. Um, one thing we're particularly concerned about that you might um, care about a lot is shellfish. Um, shellfish are what we call keystone species in estuaries. Estuaries are where tides come in and out and where fresh water is leaking out into the sea. Um, so the mouth of the Merrimack River and all the other rivers uh, that are on our coast are estuaries. And in those estuaries, um, soft shell clams uh, proliferate and other mollusks. And um, ocean acidification 
is because of the extra carbon dioxide in the air, that carbon dioxide, when, when it dissolves in the water, forms a carbonic acid, which makes it harder for shellfish to make a shell because it helps um, keep calcium dissolved and dissolve even uh, the shells that they do form somewhat. So it's a, a bigger effort for shellfish to make shells. And um, if ocean acidification really suppresses shellfish, it has a huge impact on estuaries because these animals do a tremendous job of cleaning the water. They filter unimaginable amounts of water and keep the balance of nutrients in the water um, stable. And so that's something we're really worried about is what's going to happen with shellfish. Okay, so um, those are sort of, uh, it's a it's an overall overview of some of the major uh, potential impacts um, toward to, to wildlife. It's a very broad overview, and I can answer hopefully specific questions as we as we go forward. But I'm going to talk some now about um, the kind of impacts that climate change is are, is known to have on people, um, because what we want to do is uh, protect nature for wildlife and people, and um, we'll get we'll kind of pull that together by the end. So climate change is here, and um, you know if you look at these images. It's like you think about like what is this? What do these images mean in regards to in regards to climate change? Well, you're looking at effects of storms. Okay, you're seeing flooding. You're seeing you know strong storms knocking stuff over in a nor'easter in New England um, in the winter time. Um, we know about the flooding. We don't have fires in this picture because we're talking about Massachusetts, but we could show pictures of fires out west, which have been really really epic over the um, previous fire seasons in which many years have been the hottest year on record time after time in the past 20 years, um, and fires are really increasing. But fire is not as much of a factor in Massachusetts and the Northeast as it is out West, um, and yet uh, mosquitoes are, and um, warm temperatures help mosquitoes. And what warm temperatures are doing is allowing the expansion north of species of mosquitoes that never could live here before. Um, and that means if those mosquitoes carry disease, that's a situation. Um, warmer temperatures also create ozone in the air, which is a combination of car exhaust and hot air and what happens in the, in the mix there. And that causes asthma. And so a lot of people have asthma and asthma is exacerbated by climate. And then there's just the fact of intense um, changes in local climates that can cause migration to happen, where people are leaving some parts of the earth that have gotten difficult to live in and are trying to move to places they think they can do better. So really deep impacts to both individuals and populations. And if I spoke at, at length, about all these pieces, um, you know, it, it, this is, gets really tough to face. Um, and we start to get into something that um, we've really talked about a lot, which is how do you take care of yourself while we face things that previous generations had not faced before? So we do have to take care of ourselves. We have to have hope. And we have to have things that we feel we can have agency to do to do something about this, which is what Mass Audubon wants to offer. Another thing that we can't do anymore, because <laughs> honestly, you know, the last time I gave this talk, I didn't do this, is we can't not say that, you know, climate change kind of, we can't say that climate change impacts everybody equally. And we can't not say that it doesn't impact people equally. Okay. Some populations in our society have a disproportionate impact from climate than others. And so we're gonna unpack that just a little bit here. Okay, so what we talk about now, when we make plans, when we actually think about where to put our effort, um, we want to look at climate vulnerable populations. And you see a list of them on this slide. And what happens, and some of it's specific geography, others of it isn't, is that when you look at all those impacts on human health, um, a lot of people on this list of people suffer more because of the kind of health concerns that the climate change can drive and extra hot days, smoggier air, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and other people are actually geographically located in places that are more vulnerable because of who they are. Okay. And that's something that we're not, where we don't want to avoid having to point that out anymore because it really does change how we operate. Okay. And the reason that race is a predictor of someone living near contaminated air, water, or soil is because of past practices in real estate um, and in public policy that said, we don't lend money to certain kinds of people except in this neighborhood. It's called redlining. And it was a common practice for many, many years that led to segregated communities um, where the less desirable areas um, were kind of redlined out. And then um, industries no one would want to live near were put in those areas or near those areas. And so those people have to deal with those effects more than others. And that's just a historical fact that we're not avoiding anymore. Um, so um, we believe that we should help by uh, creating better access to green space. Um, and given that uh, green space access is negatively correlated with income and education, that's where we're going to focus our efforts. So we're really working hard on urban green spaces. Now, however, for all of us, um, increasing tree canopy in any kind of urbanized area is going to help everyone but it's particularly gonna help people that have to live in places that aren't as green. And so percentage tree canopy in communities is something that's on the docket of conservation commissions everywhere and that we are working on helping to um, support the growth of. Okay, so where Mass Audubon is at now is that we can't take action on climate just because of certain birds we like, even though we wanna do that. Um, but there's a direct connection between protecting wildlife and protecting people, and particularly the most vulnerable people, due to our historic practices. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into climate solutions. Um, it's a rough situation we're in, and we're facing the potential of catastrophic changes that we just can't adapt to. And so what we're going to do is push these solutions so that um, we, we can deal and adapt to what happens and actually will, um, I, I really believe deeply, um, build a world that all of us want to live in. Okay, here's the main message. And this is, to me, um, the most important take home of this talk. We know how to solve climate change. We just know how to do it. And I know you're seeing these pictures and I should unpack them. And I know that sometimes when people see something like wind turbines on the ocean or on land or wherever, there's all kinds of discussion about where they should be and are they causing problems and can it really happen and policy and yeah, 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 all, 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 I get it. Um, but we know that if we stop burning fossil fuels and switch to sources of energy, however difficult that may be, that don't... Um, put fossil fuel, I mean, put carbon dioxide in the air, that we have to do that one way or another. And not all of it necessarily is easy. But right now, I can tell you that on the off the coast of Massachusetts, they have already sold, the government, U.S. government, has sold leases to companies that own those leases to put giant wind turbines on the ocean um, that would make as much electricity very conservatively as the entire eastern seaboard uses just off the coast of Massachusetts right now. And so that to me is really hopeful. Um, we, Mass Audubon really wants to look at what the impacts on wildlife will be, but we know we're gonna have to do something along that line and that will reduce emissions. Removing emissions means growing trees, means different practices with soils, means restoring salt marshes. Sequestering the carbon is the term, getting the carbon back out of the air and putting it in some place where it can be stored long term. And then we have to adapt to the effects that are coming that are baked in, like sea level rise. The ocean is going to continue to rise, even if we stopped pumping greenhouse gases into the air tomorrow, um, the ocean is going to continue to rise. Even if we could return the atmosphere back to the pre industrial levels tomorrow by some magic thing, um, the ocean is going to continue to rise. It's just something that takes a long time. There are lag times. It's going to happen. And so we need to adapt to that. Okay, well, how do we do it? 
Um, obviously, there are little things we can do locally and personally. One is kind of massive government policy that you're seeing in 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 the um, in terms of a big project doing uh, wind energy off of the coast. Um, but then again, on people's roofs, we can support uh, switching over to clean energy right where you are. Um, we're switching over. We're electrifying the things that burn fossil fuel. So we're electrifying vehicles. I bought an EV. Some people think, oh, it's such a fancy thing to do. And I don't drive a Tesla. I drive a Chevy Bolt. It's like a little tiny Chevy that has an electric engine. And um, one day someone said, oh, you're, um, you're so privileged driving that. And I'm like, well, what's privilege mean? What would you spend on a, a new car? And they said, we only buy used cars. And I said, well, okay, okay. What would you spend on a used car? And this particular individual said um, $30,000. And my new Chevy Bolt was $20,000. Okay. Um, I can't just drive cross country in three days in it. Um, I would have to stop to fuel more often, but I'm learning to adapt that way. I'm also having my home um, oil burner switched over to um to heat pumps, which will be electric, and um, I should be saving money on energy that way. And I'm just going to mention something else you might want to jot down if you're taking notes, which is to um, take a look at the website of the Green Energy Consumers Alliance, because they have programs that allow me to get that Chevy Bolt for $20,000. Um, that's cheaper than you'd get it if you just went into random Chevy dealer. So knowing about those programs and participating in them is uh, a big help. So Green Energy Consumers Alliance, they have a Drive Green program. You might really want to check it out if you're interested. Okay, a next thing we're going to do, that's, that's reducing emissions by changing how we operate. It's very doable, um, in many cases, very enjoyable. Um, the building I work in now was heated all winter with electric heat pumps instead of natural gas. And it was warm and it worked great. Um, and over time, it's going to save us money. Um, carbon sinks. Well, that's getting the, uh, the carbon dioxide back out of the air. Um, that's going to happen through engineering nature. But we're protectors of nature, not engineers of nature, right? No, um, we are protectors of nature. And I want to just make a statement that the, um, the old paradigm of conservation was to put nature aside, and then it would be fine and take care of itself and do what it needs to do. But that's not true anymore. Now we do need to put nature aside, but we also need to engineer it so that we can build biomass and biodiversity, and in many cases, restore processes that we've lost. Um, now, there is a really fun thing in the middle picture there of an actual carbon grabbing device fueled uh, by geothermal en energy in Iceland that um, is taking carbon out of the air and uh, sequestering it underground. Um, that's very new stuff. Uh, who knows what will happen with that? We already know enough about how to change agriculture, how to reforest deforested areas, um, and how to restore environments so that they build carbon back up so that we can restore the balance of our atmosphere. Um, the, the effort to do that in Massachusetts is very, very well supported by state policy and increasing legislation that's happening, um, but it really is going to require a lot of changes. So we will have to reduce our emissions by 50% in seven years. That sounds outlandish, but the investment that the government made in recent legislation is going to really support that. Um, and we're also going to have to start doing things that remove 15% of the emissions that we will still have um, as we go forward. So that is something Mass Audubon is working on and really supporting. Okay, well, how does Mass Audubon support that? How does Mass Audubon help protect people with nature? Um, that's going to be particularly um, germane to what we're talking about with uh, coastal stuff. Um, but adaptation is how we respond to the changes that are coming. More water in larger bursts. OK, how do we deal with that? Well, one of the ways we deal with it is we try to absorb it before it overwhelms the systems we have in place by doing things like um, building building um, rain gardens or supporting tree canopies or adding infrastructure to des landscape design that helps to absorb water, for just an example. Um, so our, our really broad brush, nature-based climate solutions. Now, these are solutions that either reduce the 
amount of carbon that's going out, reabsorb the carbon that's out there, uh, the carbon dioxide, or protect, physically protect people. So these are solutions for all those things that we need to do. Um, conserving natural areas is a big start. And you see a salt marsh in this picture on the left that I'm gonna talk about not just conserving, but restoring what we've conserved. And then integrating nature uh, like trees and other plants into our, um, into our designing of, of communities so that water is absorbed from those storms, so that trees, tree canopy is increased, so that carbon is sequestered, and so that biodiversity is supported, okay? And um, in some cases, that's very particular engineering um, that you, you put resilience back where it, it was removed earlier by re-engineering communities, um, like you see in this picture on the very right, where there's a swale that was put in to absorb rain um, in a community where that was just a lawn previously. Okay, um, there's a lot of things we can do to use nature to deal with this problem. Um, making culverts bigger. Well, culverts are kind of a boring piece of infrastructure. I've been looking at them for decades now in my career. When they're too small, they um, degrade uh, streams' ability to have um, biodiverse ecosystems. Uh, they also tend to wash out more, and so making them bigger helps make streams healthier and more biodiverse. It's good for fish. Fishermen like fish. Um, it's also good for all the creatures that use and live in streams. Um, street trees and increasing the canopy of, of uh, developed areas is something I already talked about. Uh, wetland restoration, I'm gonna show you some examples of in a bit. Um, permeable pavement, who thought of that? Whoever would have thought we'd be seriously talking about scaling up the use of pavement that can absorb rain so the water doesn't just flash off. And then down there in the lower left, you see bioswales, which is increasing carbon capture and also absorbing water that would run off. So those are just some of the little things that we're, we're talking about in communities and supporting legislation that will happen, uh, we believe. So our, our um, effort at Mass Audubon to protect land um, is, is really important. We're the largest private land owner in the state. And when we made that action agenda that I talked about very briefly in those first three major areas. Um, we are really trying to ramp up the amount of um, land that is set aside for nature and that can be res restored so that um, we can capture carbon and have resilient landscapes. Um, so we are actually doing what is needed so that carbon can be grabbed so that water can be cleaned by adding vegetation to where the water is flowing into our reservoirs, um, by preventing floods, by restoring floodplain forests and salt marshes, um, by increasing the variety of habitats that are in any given landscape. Um, and then it has all these sort of cascading positive effects, such as tourism, recreation, overall health, property values, and quality of life. And that is what conservation is doing these days. Um, it's very important that we are doing this in urban areas, not just Boston, but all the urban areas and communities around the state. Um, so um, when we add urban forests to communities, um, we remove all those pounds of air, uh, of pounds of air pollutants. Um, we avoid all that stormwater that would otherwise run off into systems that can't handle it. And that, that saves money. So in many cases, inexpensive, low-impact solutions can save us money as, as a community. Um, and then there's that, that carbon sequestration that is so important. Um, here's a really cool example. Um, down in Plymouth, Mass., um, we bought a, a former cranberry bog um, and has, has, in very short period of time, gone from kind of degraded areas of former um, uh, cranberry production into this really vibrant um, set of ecosystems that you see on the right. And so when we talk about resilience, we talk about biodiversity, we talk about biomass, we talk about actual functions that take place on that landscape on the right that are increased because of the minor modifications that we could do to re-engineer what habitats there are there. 
And what's really cool is that they didn't have to do much at all to restore herring runs into these into these systems. And that's just been it happened the first year. They just came flooding back in. Um, it was just a great story. And that's bringing all kinds of nutrients from the ocean into those forests and creating those, helping those um, those communities to take place. It's just a wonderful story. Um, I'm going to talk now for a few minutes. I'm going to keep track of time here and wind this up in time for some questions about what I personally work in in this regard. Um, I am, I have, set out in the past couple of years to learn how to foster and support and be a, a kind of cheerleader for um, restoring salt marsh um, in the Great Marsh, which is about 20,000 acres, really big area of salt marsh in Essex County. Um, and I'll tell you what this picture is about in a minute. Well, it starts with sea level rise. This is Newman Road in Newbury, which floods at the highest tides of the year really deeply. Uh, some cars can't really even make it through there. Um, but that's salty water that you shouldn't drive through, and it happens several times a year. The effect that the rising water is having on the salt marsh is increasing areas of vegetation loss, these dead areas. Um, there's patterns of that uh, vegetation loss that the gentleman in the picture previously is very familiar with, and we see it all over the place. And we don't want to lose that vegetation because then we start to lose the salt marsh. What this goes back to is an amazing history of innovation that settlers brought over various periods of time, hundreds of years of innovations, to increase yields of the special grass called Spartina patens or salt marsh hay. They were able to triple or even quadruple the yields of hay by building embankments like you see in this image, ditching water control structures, etc. And so that was very, very innovative and smart, and it created economy, and it was great, except what it has left is um, kind of a leftover legacy of alteration of the way water flows, so that here you can see one of those old embankments. It's all degraded, you know, it's all eroded down, but it is higher and denser and doesn't allow water to flow the way it does in the areas around it. Um, the ditches that are out there, another thing I'll get into in a minute, but this is sort of what natural salt marsh looks like. There's a high marsh in the foreground. That's the Spartina patens. It looks like bad hair on a windy day. And then in the background, you see that taller stuff that is the um, salt marsh cord grass or Spartina alterniflora. That's the low marsh. Um, the areas with that high stuff, or that tall grass, get flooded on average a lot more than half the time. The areas with the, the uh, shorter grass get flooded on average less than half the time. So that's high marsh and low marsh. Natural pattern. Um, what's under all that grass is a deep, deep layer, many feet in many cases of peat. It's um, sediment and roots of the living plants and decaying vegetation. And when you take a core of it, it all holds together. It's very strong stuff. Um, and it's what that grass grows on, and it is loaded with carbon. And we don't want that carbon going into the atmosphere. We want it to stay there and be built up and take carbon out of the atmosphere. So what the natural flow of hydrology on a salt marsh looks like is right here. It's like, it's like capillaries and veins in a circulatory system of the water ebbing and flowing day after day. That's the natural pattern it should look like. This is what we've made it look like. Those veins are sort of there, but there's tons of straight lines. And all the extra deep ditches that we've put in allows, um, allows oxygen to get in and allows that dead vegetation to decompose and the whole thing can sink. And those old embankments can trap water and cause vegetation to die. And the whole thing starts to subside. So that is not a natural looking salt marsh and we can restore it. It's amazing. Like you see these dead areas with no vegetation, and yet they will regenerate if we can help keep the water off of there. So here's a plan for doing that that was in the pilot study in our area that was done by trustees of reservations and by the gentleman that I'm going to be showing you in the next few pictures. Here's Jeff Wilson, our salt marsh guru. He is able to see this set of old embankments on a marsh. And then in a later period, this other set of old embankments on the marsh. And then he is also able to perceive and ground truth all the ditches. All those different colors of lines are human artifacts on the marsh. And then what you're seeing 
in the blue is what he designs to restore the wiggly hydrology of a natural marsh. Now, what that means is getting rid of a lot of those ditches, but you don't fill them. Instead, what you do, here's his design for that area. Um, you can see all the green ditches up there that need to go and only the blue ones remain. That's a lot of work. Um, and I'll show you how we do it. First, you mow hay alongside of a ditch you don't want. Then you roll the hay into the ditch. We're not filling the ditch, but we are putting hay into it. And then you tether it down with biodegradable twine. It's an incredibly low impact approach. What happens then is the tide comes and goes and comes and goes in that ditch with those, with that vegetation in there. And the sediment in the water is trapped by the vegetation. The vegetation and the sediment form a natural mix that the roots of the plants will grow into. And within three years in many sites, you can restore the peat to within 10 centimeters of the surface so that often only three applications are needed to not fill a ditch, but to heal the ditch. And that's a lot of work on all those ditches you saw in that image. But that's the work we're setting out to do. It's low impact, it's a nature-based solution, and it's what we're doing to erase a lot of the ditches. Um, what we're doing to help those impounded areas of water that are drowning the vegetation is to make very shallow drainages. We don't call them ditches, they're called runnels. And they're just drainage for those big impoundments to help them revegetate by letting that water that is kept there by the impoundments to uh, drain away. And we hope that with those um, approaches, we can restore the flow of water on the on the peat platform, and that if it is wiggly, it may be able to keep up or will keep up better with sea level rise. One of the other things we do is we take um, some of the stuff that might be dug up out of that little um, drainage area there, and we build little special higher islands for this bird. This is a bird called the salt marsh sparrow. And, you know, they're hard to see. They live way out there in the salt marsh. They are not a toucan. You know, so people don't know about them too much. But this is a species that nests in the salt marsh only. It's the only place it nests. And they nest on the ground. Their nests float um, so they can handle a little bit of flooding. But if there's too much flooding, they lose their nest. Their babies, especially if they've hatched, may drown. And what we're finding is that this species is being reduced by something along the lines of 10% uh, per year. And it is forecast that this bird is going to go extinct in my lifetime. Look at my hair, okay? And certainly in our children's lifetime, unless we do something really massive, as we have for other species. But the best thing we can do in salt marshes is to help the marsh grow up with sea level. And so that's what is a lot of the work that I have to do. Okay. What that says is it's our future we can make decisions, we can create circumstances in which we can uh, mitigate the, the climate gases that are causing this problem and reduce them, and in which we can adapt to the changes that are happening and restore balance. So we have a lot of things people can do as individuals. Um, there's just a big list here um, that we, we talk about a lot. And I don't want to, you know, break down every single one with a lot of the time we have. We're gonna send you this PDF that shows you what makes, you know, you look at it and you see what makes sense for you. But supporting Mass Audubon and other conservation organizations is one way to do it. Um, making decisions on your own to make a difference really makes a difference. Um, and then talk about it with people, uh, demystify it. Think about this in terms of what you do as an individual matters, but what your community does matters even more you know, like you create a school program around diet and then legislation that makes it more possible for people to eat healthy uh, food that has less of a climate impact is what we do to move from just what I want to what we are going to do together um, to solve this problem. So this is just one example of um, how to think about that. Um, and this is a fun one that I didn't come up with, um, but let's turn the cacti into a cactus. Um, we are going to work on this together. And we have a program that people join in on called Climate Champions, where we get together online and help um, foster legislation in Massachusetts that 
um, helps support the idea of nature-based climate solutions um, and justice and getting those goals met uh, by 2050. So um, this is the legislative agenda we have. Again, don't want to unpack every single one of these, but we have lobbyists that are helping to make this happen on a statewide level. And we're proud of what they're doing um, because what we're doing is trying to protect nature for everyone and for wildlife and to use nature to help solve this really big problem. Um, it happens on different levels with different ages. Um, you folks might participate in, in climate champions or do, do one of the other smaller programs that happens, but there's lots of programs that our big thoughtful education department is doing to actually get kids involved. So that brings me to the end of our presentation. Well, I do want to thank everyone for participating um, in our program tonight. And it's been nice to talk to you about it. And um, I hope we see you sometime. I will tell you that we run Wednesday morning birding every Wednesday, go out to Plum Island usually to see birds. It's a drop-in program at 9.30 every Wednesday, almost always at Joppa Fletch Education Center, but there's some times during the winter we go special places. So um, if you want to learn birds with us, that's something we really love to do. And um, that's what gets people kind of um, on board to do some of the protection exercises that we engage in. So if I don't see any hands up, which is not something I can make any changes to, I will thank you all for participating in the program tonight and, um, and wish you a good night and say goodbye. Thanks, everybody. It has been a, a real pleasure to uh, be here with you folks, and um, I wish you well, and Maybe we'll see you up here in Newburyport at some point. It's nice to talk to people from Chelmsford. All right, everybody have a great night.